Five, four, three. Hello, Cryptonauts, and welcome back to another episode of Cryptocurrency Chat. I am your host, Jake Jabarelli, and with me there is no co-host because both Blockchain John and Mike are out. It's a weekend. You know, stuff happens. Anyways, let's go ahead and get started with the top 10 daily stats as well as the crypto news of the day. As you can see on your screen, we have the top 10 daily stats of all the coins. Bitcoin is still in the top position. It's actually gone up quite a bit in the last seven days, 17.6% to a 56,699.12 with a market cap of just north of a trillion dollars. It's doing quite well. If you have Bitcoin, you're probably loving it. And it's not even McDonald's. Anyways, Ethereum's in the second place with 35.32.78, a 3% gain over the last seven days and a market cap of $417.1 billion. You could probably have noticed this before, but Bitcoin's dominance is up, up here at the top at uh, 44%, whereas ETH is a little bit less than 20%, so it's not really keeping up with Bitcoin right now. Cardano is in third place with $2.22. Seven-day loss of 1.7% and a market cap of 71 billion. Still roughly, it's probably more like a fifth now of the second place, and of course, less than a tenth of Bitcoin. But if you notice Tether, which of course is just a stable coin, is right there behind Cardano. Also, and I'll make this note, even though Tether is in fourth place, and of course it doesn't move much, its trading volume is always higher than everybody else. If I were to sort this by 24 hour trading volume, you'd always notice that Tether is higher than everything else, including Bitcoin. Even at Bitcoin's highest, Tether is always, it's because everyone's trading into Tether. So 69.4 billion market cap. Binance coin is in fifth place, 417.40, a 3.3% seven day loss and a $64.5 billion market cap. Ripple or XRP is in sixth place, $1.16 is the current price, 10% double digit seven day gains and a $54.3 billion uh, current market cap. Solana is still holding on to seventh place, price of $151.51, interesting. A pretty hefty loss in the last seven days of 12.3% and a $45.4 billion market cap. In eighth place is Polkadot, as it has been holding for quite some time. An 8.5% gain over the last seven days, a price of $34.93, and a market cap of $36.2 billion. USD coin, yet another stable coin, also in the top 10, uh, is currently at a dollar, as it always is, it's a stable coin, and it has a uh, market cap of $33.2 billion. And then Dogecoin, not far behind, not to be left out, Dogecoin is making its resurgence again here, although it should be going back to $0.30, cents, if I'm honestly being honest here, that a, the best position for a lot of people that got into it was when it started going up really high. It would be nice to see it return to you know $0.70. Cents. Anyway, the point is it's currently $0.23.5. Cents. 70 gain of 6.1% and a market cap of 31 dollars uh, billion even. And I know this is the top 10 and I have been talking as of late about things like uh, Shiba Inu, who's currently again in, well, still in 12th place at 214.4% seven day gain. Now it did come down from its peak, but it's doing exceptionally well for a, for a puppy coin or a mock of uh, Doge. Its price is actually very low at 0 0.000261. Nine, one. That's of a dollar, so less than one one thousandth or less than two one thousandths of a penny. It's not a very expensive coin, but that's also because there's a whole lot of it. But as a contrast, Terra, which is an 11th at $40 and a, cap of, a market cap of $16 billion, and Binance USD, which used to be up closer to the position nine, has dropped down quite a bit. By comparison, but it's not because it didn't have a lot of volume. It's just that these other coins have more volume, and then Avalanche is below Binance. So there's, I know this is the top 10, but these other coins are important to look at if you're looking at getting into anything of that sort. <clears throat> Remember to pick up your uh, candies 
whenever you get the chance. I can see here that I have been regularly collected. I have the notifications set up so I know to make sure to pick up the candies. Uh, now, I, I deliberately waited till this time to show you that you can get a lot of candies if you keep picking it up every single day. It just keeps incre incrementing and incrementing. This is the sixth day in the row that I've collected, and I got 60 candies, and of course tomorrow I'll get 100, which is quite a bit more than what I was getting before. And I'm going to get back to 10,000 pretty soon. If I keep this up, that's very good for me because there's all kinds of things, NFTs, discounts, uh, swag bags, all kinds of neat stuff you guys can get in the reward section if you just keep visiting CoinGecko every single day in order to collect that. I know, I believe I bought the uh, How to DeFi, and they obviously have a lot of these left. So if you want to check out all these little neat options, um, remember to collect your, collect your candies, and there's plenty to choose from. That being said, let's just tap on to the uh, reminders. If you like our content, please show your appreciation by liking and subscribing if you're on YouTube. Um, check us out on Discord or Reddit. And if you want to help support the platform, which we sincerely appreciate, please, if you'd like to donate, you can donate in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance, or Basic Attention Token, or BAT. All the links are in the description below on whatever platform you're listening on Anchor or you're watching on YouTube. It's all in the description. On to the news. So, Bitcoin in 2009. Emmy winner Ted Lasso drops crypto reference. Isn't that interesting? This article is from John Jeff, uh, Jeff John Roberts. In the latest sign of crypto seeping into popular culture, the hit TV show Ted Lasso dropped a reference to Bitcoin in its season two finale that came out Friday on Apple TV. The Bitcoin mention comes in a scene where the character Sam Obisanya, Obi Obi Sanya, Obi Sanya is torn over whether to stay in his London-based soccer club or to accept a billionaire's prestigious offer to join Team in Casablanca. Speaking by phone from Nigeria, his father counsels Sam to let the universe give him a sign, to which Sam responds by asking if the decision might be too important to leave to the universe. The universe has always put me on the right path. The universe told me to marry your mother and to buy Bitcoin in 2009. 2009, his father exclaims. And both characters chuckle. In 2009, Bitcoin had just started trading and was worth less than a penny. When Ted Lasso, when the Ted Lasso episode aired, its price was over $55,000, which makes Sam's father a true crypto OG and a very, very wealthy man if he held on to it, which the show seems to imply. It's unclear what led the writers to drop the Bitcoin reference in the finale of Ted Lasso, which in Apple TV's biggest hit to date, and which was the runway winner at last month's Emmy Awards, Ted Lasso is hardly the first hit to drop a crypto reference in the award-winning Billions. The lead character, Toby, uh, Toby, Bobby Axelrod, rewards his favorite employee with a USB stick containing $5 million in crypto, which his son gets into trouble for mining Bitcoin at the college campus. Meanwhile, the sci-fi series Mr. Robot includes a prominent reference to crypto, while Silicon Valley has an episode titled Initial Coin Offering, which sees a bombastic tech executive announce a pivot to something called Piper Coin. The very popular TV reference to Bitcoin reportedly came all the way back in 2012 in the show The Good Wife, while the second appears to have come a year later on The Simpsons, Quiz show Jeopardy has also repeatedly referred to Bitcoin, including for the first time in 2013 in an episode. The third season of Ted Lasso will only begin airing next summer. So we'll have to find out if the Bitcoin reference was a one-off or if the show's writers who appear to know a thing or two about it will invoke crypto again. Uh, I think it's interesting to see the references. It almost feels like a stretch to really just like, okay, yeah, great, they referenced it. You know, some people are referencing Bitcoin, but I mean, Bitcoin gets talked about all the time. I, guess, I think the thing that's most important in this 
is to recognize that when we're referencing crypto, we're referencing it in a positive light. And this show dirt certainly does. You know, letting people go, well, if you'd only bought into Bitcoin, you'd be a multimillionaire now. Great. Uh, 2020 hindsight, right? On to the next piece. El Salvador to use Bitcoin profits to build pet hospital. I'm glad that, that they have a noble purpose in mind. El Salvador president said Saturday that the country will use profits from its Bitcoin holdings to build a pet hospital. President Nayib Bukele, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name, who made Bitcoin a legal tender in the country on September 7th, wrote on Twitter that the country's Bitcoin trust has a surplus of $4 million due to the surging price of the cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is up 15.6% in the last week alone. Today trades at 55,270. We know that's not true. It's actually higher than that. Bukele, uh, Bukele said that the money was will be invested in a pet hospital and posted a computer-generated video of the upcoming project. There is a tweet here for those of you who can't see the, vi the um, video. I can't. I'm not going to pretend to speak Spanish well enough to read this, um, but you guys can check out the tweet. It came on October 9th. By the way, we're not selling any BTC. We're using the USD part of the trust since the BTC, the Bitcoin part, is now worth more than when the trust was established, he wrote on Twitter. The government of El Salvador, a tiny and poor Central American country, has a Bitcoin trust to facilitate transactions between U.S. dollars and the asset. El Salvador uses the dollar, but now businesses have begun to accept Bitcoin as payment if they have a technological means as part of the country's Bitcoin law. Bukele, uh, Bukele added that the pet hospital will be able to attend 384 consultants with 128 emergencies. El Salvador is the first country in the world to use Bitcoin as legal tender. The law was an idea of Bukele and has been both praised and criticized. The country has a state wallet called Shivo, which citizens can download to make everyday transactions. Those who use it are rewarded with $30 in Bitcoin, which, as anyone probably knows, is not a whole lot. Bukele was previously po very popular in El Salvador, mainly because crime has dipped in the country since he assumed power. El Salvador is one of the most murderous nations on the planet, but his new Bitcoin law has proven divisive. Last month, thousands of Salvadorians hit the streets to protest against his increasingly authoritarian ways and the Bitcoin law. Parts of the crypto community, particularly those heavily involved in Bitcoin, have praised Bukele for the new law, while institutions such as World Bank have said it will be difficult to enact. Not everyone in the crypto community thinks Bukele is a mastermind. Vitalik Buterin, the co-founder of Ethereum, the second largest cryptocurrency on the planet by market cap, if you didn't already know, said Friday that President Bukele should not be praised by the crypto community. This tactic of pushing Bitcoin to millions of people in El Salvador at the same time with almost no attempt at prior education is reckless and it risks a large number of innocent people getting hacked or scammed, he wrote on Reddit. Will the citizens of El Salvador like their leader's latest pre project? It sounds like they don't. It seems kind of like a, a money grab or land grab, I guess is a more common phrase. It's the, uh, oh, if we do this, we'll get all this money. But I mean, he's already talking about putting in a pet hospital. Just a pet hospital? What about a children's hospital? Why are pets more important? Is, did he read some statistics that said Salvadorians love their pets more than their kids? I don't know. feels like a little bit more of a weird Western move. So moving on to the next one. This is articles by Tim Haki. Edward Snowden, CBDCs are crypto fascist currencies that could casually annihilate savings. So CBDC will probably be explained in this article. But basically, in a barbed tweet yesterday, NSA consultant turned whistleblower Edward Snowden said that the central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, could annihilate or could casually annihilate the savings of every wage worker in the country. Snowden began his attack against the nascent prominent of CBDCs 
digital currencies backed by monetary reserves of a central bank in the response to an article by New York Times guest columnist Dr. Iswar Pasad, a professor of trade policies at Cornell University. Dr. Prasad highlighted the growing move toward a cashless economy, a move signaled by the research and <clears throat> trials of CBCs in countries such as China, Sweden, Japan, Britain, as well as the European Central Bank, which this summer warned countries that the tech sector may soon outpace governments if they don't start to prepare start preparing their own digital currencies. Snowden highlighted a portion of Dr. Prasad's article where the academic, uh, the academic theorized that if the American economy was in dire straits and the Federal Reserve had already shrunk the interest rate it controlled to zero, the Fed could then impose a negative interest rate by gradually shrinking the electronic balances in everyone's digital currency accounts. It's worth noting that when in inflation is too low, Negative interest rates can encourage borrowing and spending to encourage interest rates to climb back up, since holding physical cash itself is itself expensive. There's secure storage space to consider. A bank is more likely to either lend money to other banks or pay the negative interest rate. While that might work for commercial banks, Snowden sees Prasad's piece as ominous for regular savers, under a new regime of CBDCs, arguing that the currencies would be a useful policy tool for annihilating the savings of every wage worker in the country if they don't spend them fast enough. There's a very long tweet here for those of you who can't see. I'm just going to read Snowden's comment on um, the other comment that was in this. What a, a central bank or a central bank digital currency, you ask? Oh, you know, just a useful tool for casually annihilating the savings of every worker in the country if they don't spend them fast enough. So going on, Snowden elaborated on his CBDC fares in a blog post published a few hours later. He called CBCs a perversion of the founding principles and protocols of cryptocurrency, a crypto fascist cryptocurrency, an evil twin entered into the ledgers on opposite day expressly designed to deny its users the basic ownership of their money and to install the state as a mediating center of every transaction. This is starting to sound familiar, isn't it, with what we're already doing? Snowden started with a condensed history of money from its humble origin as scarce pieces of precious metal mined from the Earth's bowels, tracing it up to its current incarnation, often as digital future, uh, figures in a banking app. He then explained the promise of decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, which offer a method of storing and trading money from intermediaries like banks and financial services, before suggesting that CBDC threaten the very principle of crypto by radically re-centralizing the, mon the monetary system so that every digital penny is once more controlled by a central bank. Some algorithm, uh, alg algorithmic stablecoins do just what Snowden fears, remove coins from people's wallets to alter the total supply, the value of the coins. The difference is that these mechanisms known as rebases occur autonomously according to parameters set by the community, not by central banks that Snowden distrusts. Snowden isn't alone in his cynicism towards CBCs. The August pardon me, in August a survey of twenty five hundred British adults conducted by Politico concluded that only 24% of British adults surveyed believe that CBCs would be a net positive for society and 30% believing it would do more harm than good. All around three quarters of respondents were concerned that cyber attacks would undermine a CBDC issued by the Bank of England. The growing buzz around CBDCs shows no sign of abating, but people are clearly worried about their money being attacked by cyber criminals, or in the case of Edward Snowden and Dr. Prasad, by their own government's central bank. As V says in V for Vendetta, people should not fear their governments. Governments should fear their people. Moving on. Another article by Tim Huckey. Stacks blows up 57% after Bitcoin NFTs take off. This is not all that surprising, although because of the major interest in, 
NFTs as of right now. So the demand for stacks, a blockchain that combines Bitcoin with smart contracts, is soaring. The price of STX token has risen 57% in the last 24 hours to a price of $2.30, just as the nascent NFT market picks up. SDX explosive price movement caused a the cryptocurrency to rise 13 places in the global market capitalization rankings with a market cap of now 2.9 billion it's now the 55th largest cryptocurrency in the world according to crypto data aggregator nomics stacks latest push has been into bitcoin's nfts there are unconventional these are unconventional in crypto particularly since Bitcoin doesn't natively support smart contracts, and most of the NFT market runs on Ethereum, which does, which does natively support smart contracts. The Stacks, pardon me, the Stacks blockchain supports smart contracts, but all of its transactions are rolled up and settled on Bitcoin. Stacks founder Muneeb Ali describes it to decrypt as a layer 1.5 last month, distinguishing it from Ethereum's layer 2 solutions like Arbitron and Polygon. Although Stack's NFT marketplace is fairly new, Bitcoin NFTs have existed for years. Before Ethereum came along, some of the first tokenized digital assets were minted and sold on Counterparty, a third-party Bitcoin protocol as early as 2012. Stack's NFT market picks up. There are signs that Stack's NFT market is rising on Monday, 12-year-old Abram Finley sold out of a collection of $8,000 worth of hand-drawn pixelated bird, uh, Bitcoin bird NFTs in under an hour on the Stacks marketplace. By Thursday, Bitcoin birds became the most transacted NFT on Stacks, trading 16,651 SDX, or about $21,000 worth of the tokens in 24 hours. CryptoPunks knocked off Stacked Punks, <laughs> or not, yes, also performed well this week. Stacked Punks has currently traded about 620,528 STX worth of tokens, or roughly $1.3 million. It's worth bearing in mind that Stacks NFT launches are very modest news compared to the NFT trading that happens daily on Ethereum. In the last 24 hours, Ethereum-based game Axie Affinity traded over $20 million worth of tokens, according to NFT data aggregator CryptoSlam. Other market contract blockchains like Solana, Flow, and Ethereum, scaling solution Polygon, that is, have also grabbed their share of NFT boom. Still, SDX inventors, or pardon me, investors are clearly excited about the prospect of more Bitcoin NFTs and uh, Bitcoin-backed decentralized finance products. The potential foothold in the booming NFT and DeFi markets is big news for Bitcoin maxis out there. Yeah, I think this is gonna do well. I'm glad to see it's, people are taking advantage of it per this image at the top of the article. It's the Bitcoin birds that sold out for $8,000 within an hour. Go Bitcoin NFTs, go stacks. Pretty awesome. We have talked about this before, so get in early if you have a chance. This next article, again from Tim Haki, XRP surges 9% while Ripple swamps SEC with legal docs. Here you go, SEC. Here's all our proof that we're not a security. The price of XRP, the seventh largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization, blew up by 9% in the last 24 hours to $1.19. Its rise followed several strong maneuvers by XRP progenitor Ripple this week in the 10th month of its courtroom battle against the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Since December 21st, 2020, Ripple has locked horns with the SEC in a grueling legal spat. That sounds very technical. The SEC alleges that Ripple made $1.38 billion by selling XRP as an unregistered security. Ripple denies that the sales of, that the sales constitute securities offering, offerings. Pardon me. On Thursday, Ripple filed a letter to U.S. Magistrate Judge Netburn. That sounds like a bad name for a person dealing with the internet. Calling out the SEC for negligence in its handling of the case after Ripple received barely any answers to the 30,000 requests for admission, RFAs, that it lodged with the SEC since, SEC since the case began. RFAs are a yes or no questions 
that aim to move the lawsuit along faster by resolving ambiguities in the case. The SEC called the RFAs abusive, unreasonable, and oppressive, and claimed that it was overwhelmed by the sheer number of them, arguing that it took over 100 hours to respond to about 254 RFAs already. The SEC says it needs about 24 minutes on each RFA in order to give the right answer, as these answers can be used against them in court. In Thursday's letter to the judge, Ripple countered that the $1.38 billion disengorgement, pardon me, disgorgement, the SEC seeks from contracts that the SEC has not thoroughly reviewed. Ripple played another strong hand against the SEC this week. At the center of the new debate is a 2018 speech from the former director of the SEC's Division of Corporate Finance, Bill Hinman. In the speech, Bill Hinman said that Ethereum was not a security. The SEC claims that this was Hinman's personal opinion, but Ripple Defense says it has been seen and it has seen an email chain to a third party in the SEC's privilege log, which reveals that Hinman's speech reflected SEC policy. On Friday, Judge Sarah Netburn, yes, that's the one, Netburn, she's burning the net, ruled in favor of Ripple and will include the email chain in her review. It is unknown when the outcome will be decided. XRP's overnight price performance indicates growing confidence this week that Ripple is weathering this terrible legal storm. I think that says about everything I want to talk about there. So moving on to Xu Yao Kong's uh, article, NFTs are still hot in China despite crypto crackdown. Doesn't surprise me. It seems like the Chinese don't seem to care what the government says. Not that that's any different than the United States. In July, I formed a thesis that crypto is going through the Chinalization <laughs> period in which China's anti-crypto regulation would force miners and centralized exchanges to go on exile while the rest of the projects go underground. That did play out as we seen almost all miners leaving China and chasing electricity all over the world. But little did I foresee the staying power of the NFT. All of a sudden, my crypto WeChat was full of punk fanboys, Ape Guardian and Loot Revolutionaries. So let's decrypt the China NFT scene a little and let's start by distinguishing between the two types of NFTs we're seeing in China. Web 2.0 NFTs are the JPEG created by the Chinese internet giants such as Alibaba and Tencent. These JPEGs are relatively cheap, have no real crypto element exchanged in RMB and live on the centralized ledger not tradable on the secondary market and have distinct Chinese cultural elements, e.g. slang or internet phenomena, as you can see in this image here. Web 3.0 NFTs are similar to the crypto NFTs most people are familiar with these days, but there are some differences. Chinese Web 3.0 NFTs such as contain Chinese cultural elements, example collections Riverman or Kung Fu Hero. Riverman is derived from the longest painting in China along the river during the Qingming festival, considered a national treasure. Multi-chained, as many of them are, launched on Binance Smart Chain, and gamified, or gamified. Pioneered by Popmart's blind boxes, many NFTs are not selling JPEGs, but selling a surprise experience. You don't know what you'll get. Here are two compelling NFT communities in China, Club 721, is the newest NFT club on the block, a community of NFT collectors who share the latest news, analysis, and drops in NFT. Of course, the, a DAO is coming. For a founding product, uh, pardon me, for a founding group of the seven people, the community has expanded to more than 7,000 community members. Its success was uh, inevitable in hindsight given the stage of the NFT cycle we're in and its wealth creation. Everyone wants to know about the newest drop so they can buy and get a 10x exit. The Club 721 came uh, at the right time and there's a lot of information, fragmentation and asymmetry for Chinese audiences who want to ape into the newest collection. It feels a bit to me like the early DeFi summers, uh, summer days 
where communities are forming rapidly around thought leaders who aggregate global information. Going forward, Club 721 aims to evolve into a gated NFT community similar to Friends with Benefits or PleaserDAO, meaning that only members who hold community tokens or NFTs have a right to participate. The other option here is MaoDAO. MaoDAO is undisputedly the biggest space for NFT contributors, advocates, and thought leaders in China. Its RPC, or Ready Player Cat, uh, series and uh, sheer dedication to the play to earn distinguishes MaoDAO from other JPEG spect spectator groups. Compared to many NFT studios that drop JPEGs and leave MaoDAO continues to uh, build gaming and financial instruments, the metaverse is its endgame. And, it, and what impresses me most about MaoDAO is how active it is in promoting Chinese culture through NFTs, such as this moon drop I received. I don't see the image unless he's talking about a different image. Um, black sesame paste mooncake accompanied with a silver needle with white tea presented in a decorative paper wrap with origami finish. Okay, well there's a description, but that doesn't say what it is. Well, it says what it is, but doesn't show it. Anyways, what's next for NFTs in China? The, the Web 2.0 NFT will continue to evolve in a compliant way. Chinese internet giants will build their own NFTs, not on Ethereum, but corporate uh, networks like Ant Group and Ant Chain. Their NFTs will be endorsed by local celebrities and will gain wider adoption. Meanwhile, Chinese gaming giants will rapidly incorporate NFTs into their existing gaming empires and build out a metaverse perhaps something bigger than what Facebook is promising. However, just like the internet, China's metaverse will be sanctioned and gated by the Great Wall, and that will turn off crypto purists. The Web 3.0 NFTs will face challenges. They're more likely, more, more closely tied to the crypto ecosystem and touch coins that make the government anxious. At the moment there's no clear regulation against nfts perhaps due to their nascency but since people need crypto to purchase nfts if the government continues to crack down on crypto on ramps like web 3.0 nfts will face barriers perhaps a more concerning effect if china extends its crackdown to nfts would not be consumer participation but artist participation after all, NFTs are a cultural phenomena propelled largely by art tastes, especially the tastes of the influencers. That's why we need more communities like Crypto Art Panda to cultivate and nurture domestic artists and creators. Without them, China will only be a consumer in this revolution, never a creator. I think that's actually pretty well written, so I'm going to leave it at that. Here we are going with Vitalik Buterin's comment. This is actually from uh, the day before. Vitalik Buterin's El Salvador Bitcoin approach is contrary to the ideals of crypto. I, I agree with him. In a surprise Reddit post on Friday, Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin had strong words for El Salvador's Bitcoin rollout and specifically President Naib Bukele's for forcing local governments to accept the top cryptocurrency. After a Reddit user on the R or Reddit cryptocurrency subreddit posted, uh, quote, unpopular opinion, El Salvador Mis uh, President Mr. Uh, Naib Bukele should not be praised by crypto by the crypto community. Buterman replies, nothing unpopular about this opinion making it mandatory for businesses to accept specific cryptocurrency is contrary to the ideals of freedom that are supposed to be so important in the crypto space. Buterin's post continued this tactic of publishing BTC to, uh, pushing BTC to millions of people in El Salvador at the time with almost no attempt to at prior education is reckless and risks a large number of innocent people getting hacked or scammed. Shame on everyone. Okay, fine. I'll call out the main people responsible here. Shame on Bitcoin maximalists who are uncritically praising him. Indeed, Bukele's embrace of Bitcoin as legal tendered, first announced with great fanfare as the Bitcoin Miami conference in June, has earned him raves from all the loudest voices in Bitcoin. Those same Bitcoin flag wavers 
have been less eager to talk about the young president's well-documented authoritarian tendencies and the less savory aspects of his government's Bitcoin rollout. One Salvadorian business owner, business owner, requiring anonymity, told Decrypt, it crushes my soul to see Bitcoin maximalists around the world cheering when this, when if they actually sat down and read the law and regulations, it is completely opposite to everything they preach. And Buterin isn't the only voice in crypto speaking out against about the contradiction in forcing an open decentralized techno technology on business owners. At uh, the Token 2049 conference in London just this week, Blockchain.com co-founder Nicholas Carey said a, uh, during a panel, I think there are there's some valid criticisms of how the program is rolled out in El Salvador in terms of being top down. One of the main ethos of crypto is that there are rarely, pardon me, really grassroots adoption and people are doing it voluntarily. Bernard didn't stop at this for his first post. Further down in the same thread, when the original poster uh, commented, it's like Bukele pu pushed it it, because he thought at a cheaper, he bought it at a cheaper price, and knew country, knew a country adopting a crypto would alone take the higher price enough to make him rich, take the price higher. Pardon me. Um, Buterin replied, simpler and dumber hypotheses, both for the po political reasons and because he's a human being like the rest of us. He just loves being praised by people he considers powerful, i.e., Americans. Bitcoin maximalists are a very easy community to get to praise you. You just have to be in the position of power and to do or say nice things about them and their coin. The original poster replied to Buterin, Elon did the same exact thing. Now Bakuli is explo exploiting the emotions of the community. Nothing new there. This is how it all works. And the last article, although it is also from October 9th, is from Michael Dell. Actually, it's from Decrypt staff, and I get the impression I should probably not be reading this because of what it is, but I'm going to go through it anyways. Dell founder Michael Dell is going to pass on Bitcoin. Michael Dell, the founder of the computer company Dell Technologies, is going to pass on Bitcoin. Speaking at the New York Times in an interview published today, Dell said that I said although he is not getting into Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, is probably underrated. His final word on Bitcoin, I don't know, 56 year old billionaire who created the company that built the computer that uh, this article has written with may well be a genius. His computer company, which has sold about 800 million PCs, has a market cap of $80 billion. But Bitcoin, a globally distributed network of virtual cash, eats figures like that for breakfast and even vomits them up hours later. In the past week, Bitcoin rose 15%, or about $150 billion. In fact, Bitcoin is now 13 times more valuable than Mr. Dell's company. Dell didn't entirely pass on Bitcoin. In mid-2014, the company accepted Bitcoin payments through a partnership with Coinbase. In a long, a month-long promotion in July 2014, it offered 10% savings on Alienware computers using Bitcoin up to $150. Back then, Bitcoin was worth about 620. That means that 150 would have been worth $13,770 today. Dell stopped accepting Bitcoin October 2017 due to low demand. Maybe Dell got things wrong once again. Shortly after Bitcoin spiked to highs of not quite 20 grand, the highest price of Bitcoin until earlier this year. I, it still feels like a dodge move having uh, Michael Dell say, yeah, yeah, we're not into that. Maybe you're in a different coin, or maybe he's just like, just ignore Bitcoin for right now because we don't want anybody else to think about it. So that's where I think I was going with this. Um, that's all we're going to be talking about today. I don't have any of my cohorts here in order to bounce these ideas off to, so I really appreciate that if you were here listening to the Sunday evening, which is now Monday morning uh, here on the Pacific coast of, of the United States, um, I just got in a little bit late. I was out like like Mike and John, but got back just in time to do this. So 
I really appreciate all of you listening. Thank you for listening to me by myself ramble on about crypto. Uh, please remember, if you appreciate our show and are watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. That helps the algorithm get us a little bit more uh, recognition. Check us out on Discord. The link for that, as well as Reddit, is down in the description. And if you would like to donate because you appreciate our content, please donate either by Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance, or Basic Attention Token. All, as I said, the links are in the description below. So I appreciate you all listening to this uh, podcast tonight. And it will probably be going up tomorrow morning. But um, as John always says, stack sats and hodl. Adios.